Good morning, church. We are so glad that iPhones were invented, so you all made it here on time. Um, that, that was one thing. I checked my phone, because you, your body's in a routine of when you wake up, and so at 6 o'clock, I was up, and I said, that's not right. Um, so, but thankfully, my clock switches, and, and all of you are here plenty early, so it looks like you all um, had the same thing. So we're thankful um, for that time change difference. We're thankful for all of you who showed up last week to our fall festival. It was um, an incredible time. We had so many uh, families show up. Um, we handed out, I mean, over 500, or I think we had 500 corn, dog, corn dogs made. And so 500 plus corn dogs were eaten. Um, so it was just a great day. And we can't do those activities without your service and having those booths and the giving of your time and of candy. Uh, most importantly, of the candy, Kit Kats. Uh, but we want to um, thank you all for being here. Uh, today is uh, the National um, Intentional Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. And so as we stand and pray to worship this morning, I wanna, I'm going to pray specifically um, for the persecuted churches across our world. All right, so if you'll stand, I'll pray and we'll begin worship. God, I want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for the time that we have um, to freely worship you. But Lord, uh, freely worshiping you doesn't necessarily just happen in buildings like ours. No, freely worshiping you is, is a commitment that we make every day. And Lord, there's people who make commitments to you, to worship you, to love you, to serve you, even when it's not a freedom by this world's standards. Even when there, there's a, a chance of chains and there's a chance of persecution, Lord, that they still choose to rise and lift your name. So Lord, let us, let us pray on their behalf. Not that um, they cannot face difficulties, but Lord, that they can continue to be steadfast in their worship and living of you and their evangelism of, make, of making your name known and that we can take that example and live with that boldness. Not praying for ease, not praying for comfort, but Lord, praying for a confidence knowing that you are better than anything that this world could ever do to us. So Lord, let us lift those saints up across the world who are worshiping you this morning. In your name I pray, amen. Amen, let's worship together. We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, spread the tide. Wafted on the rolling tide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, tell to sin as far and wide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing the islands of the sea, echo back the ocean caves, earth shall keep her jubilee, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. the winds. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shall salvation fully free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory. Salvation full and free, highest hills and deepest caves. This is our song. 
Father, his love for us is deeper than any ocean. Sing it out. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. That he should give his only son. To make a wretch his trail. Be 
Behold. Behold the man upon the cross. My sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my knocking voice. Call out among the
just ask that uh, uh, that you be with us as we continue worshiping this morning, that, uh, that you make it well with our soul, that we focus on you and only you, Father. Uh, we love you and we praise you. In your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amazing love that welcomes me. 
They're back. Awesome. Way to go. Thank you for leading us this morning. Uh, I'm excited today. I got an extra hour of sleep last night. Usually it takes me a month to adjust, but I adjusted in one night. That was, that was good. Uh, and, uh, and then also I walked in the light this morning. I could see where I was going. And it was a wonderful change from the last couple of months where you just kind of stagger around in the dark and hope that you make it home safely. Uh, and I titled the message this morning, Darkness and Light, a long time before I realized it was going to be the changing of the time uh, today. Because in our text this morning in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through uh, 21, uh, the aging Peter, knowing that the time of his life is nearly over, is talking to the churches about how to deal with the reality of false teachers. If you think about that, that's amazing. It's less than, you know, it's, it's still the first century, and already the church has been in, infiltrated by people who have, uh, uh, what would you call it? You'd, they have uh, l desires that are not uh, pure as far as how they want to lead the churches. They're in it for the, themselves. And he's pointing out to them that after he dies, that they, he wants them to be able to spot those false teachers, stay away from those false teachers, and keep the church going. That's his main intent. And in the midst of these verses I'm going to read this morning, it talks about how to navigate uh, darkness and being in a dark world and how that we can nevertheless uh, continue on as far as living for Christ and the church remaining strong. Uh, the reality of life is uh, in the world in which we live is not so much like today where I'm walking in the light. It's more like uh, how my wife has been the last month or two where she takes a little flashlight with her uh, when she goes walking so she won't stumble into a hole and so oncoming traffic doesn't run over her. She's uh, cautious. You're just kind of going with a, with a light. And that's a picture that Peter gives here of how we navigate the world in which we live, uh, that it's not just bright and obvious, but that there is a source of light uh, that we can follow as we live in the darkness. So I'll begin reading at verse uh, 16 and read through the end of chapter 1. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we came, made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we are eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven as we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in the dark place. There's the darkness and light. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. They didn't make it up. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. God has provided Scripture to guide us in this fallen world. As we look at these verses together this morning, three very simple statements that I hope will help you as you navigate life and everything that you do in the world in which we live. Uh, God allows darkness, God provides light, and light overwhelms darkness. First of all, God allows darkness. Uh, life is as God allows Life is not as God prefers. Life is not as God originally planned. Life is as God allows. And so, when, and I understand this because I've said it myself. Uh, so when we instinctively say, uh, why? Why would this happen? God is good, God is just, and it seems like the wrong people are being rewarded here, and why, could, you know, why did this happen? Why? The simple answer is, God allows darkness. The way the world is set up, whenever uh, sin entered into the world, Adam and Eve made a choice to, to choose to sin, and ever since then, everybody else has been choosing to sin. And since that's a reality, God allows darkness. That's, that, that's a reality that we live with. God allows darkness. Um, he says in verse 19, the way we navigate this world is that we pay attention to the scriptures as to a light shining in a dark place, a spiritually dark place that we're to do that. And so get straight in your mind that it's never a question of something happening because God can't do anything about it. 
that he is hindered in some way and he's not all-powerful, not all-knowing. Something's wrong with God and that's why this occurs. It's not a problem with God. I was reading the other day about Abraham and Sarah. And when God came to Abraham, he's about to turn 100, and he says, within a year you're going to have a son, and Sarah's going to be the one who has the baby. And, and Abraham says, well, all of us would have said, how in the world is that going to be? You know, we're, uh, we just checked into the assisted living, and what, what are you talking about? And, uh, and uh, the angel says, nothing is too hard for God. And so as we live life, yes... God allows darkness, but nothing is too hard for God. So it's never a question of God can't do anything about it, and so it's, it's, it's the way it is. Uh, God allows darkness. The darkness of spiritual ignorance. Uh, in the New Testament, when light is referred to, symbolically it refers, for, it refers to spiritual insight and moral purity. Uh, believing right and doing right. And so when darkness is allowed, first of all, there's, there's this darkness of spiritual ignorance where there's not any spiritual insight. So there's all kinds of crazy ideas. He, Peter uses the word eyewitnesses in verse 16. This is a word that many of the false teachers used that, that they referenced how they had the inside track, they were eyewitnesses, and they knew things that nobody else did. And some of these false teachers, bear with me just a second, I think this is important. So I'm, I'm, there's a lot of things I don't think are important, I'd say it anyway, but this is important. Uh, I'm never, going to get this, I'm never going to get this deal figured out. I mean, why do I say stupid stuff? Because uh, don't answer that. Uh, okay, so the word eyewitnesses, it was used by this group of religions because they were called mystery religions. And what they would do is they, had, they were kind of like a cult, like, kind of like a, a secret order of things. And if you got into this mystery religion, then they would, you would get to know what it was, was the secret object that they had that nobody else knew was true. And there are records of some of those mystery religions that they would have the ceremony and then they would open the box and let the person see once they got into their group. And uh, one of those, the object that you saw, get this, corn cob. That was what they had, but they, nobody else knew it, but the people that are in this group, and that's what they, it's corn cob, and so these crazy ideas that people had going on, and Peter says, in contrast to that, we were eyewitnesses of his glory. We were on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus himself. We saw him when he was almost like he's going to appear when he returns the second time. We were eyewitnesses, not of a corn cob. We were eyewitnesses of his glory. We, we heard the voice of God saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. We heard it at, the, at his baptism. We heard it on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is the truth. We didn't just make all this up when he says we weren't just telling you a myth. That was the, the false teachers were saying, ah, oh, he's just making all this stuff up. He said Jesus is going to come back. Jesus didn't come back. It's not going to happen. He's just a liar. He just made all this stuff up. And Peter says, I'm an eyewitness. I'm one. I didn't see a corn cob in a box. I saw Jesus in all his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. And so there was darkness then, the darkness of spiritual ignorance where there were people who thought if they could keep it secret, there was a corn cob in the box, and they were a club, and they had everything that they uh, needed, and uh, that was their false belief. Our world is filled with the darkness of spiritual ignorance. There are people who worship passion, uh, possessions, power. Uh, you're going to worship something, and people have opted in our world today not to worship Jesus Christ, and they come up with all kinds of crazy ideas. And people have no, they're walking in the darkness. And so it shouldn't surprise us when there are things that happen uh, around us where people is like, can, I can't believe they would think that. But they're still in darkness. And there is, God allows the darkness, the darkness of spiritual ignorance. The darkness of moral failure. Uh, light referred to spiritual insight, it also referred to moral purity, that you've lived in obedience to God. Uh, later on in this book, or this letter, Peter reveals to us all of the failures in various ways. And by moral failure, I don't just mean morality. I mean all kinds of the breaking of laws and the sins that exist in abundance. Uh, and he shows all of the compromises that are made by the false teachers. There's this darkness of moral failure. And... Um, as it was true then, it's true now. Uh, my default mode, anytime I hear anybody say anything anymore, I'm, I would say almost every time, my default mode is to think they're lying to me. 
I've been getting a deal on my phone. Every, I got it every day for about two weeks. It says, this is your final notice before we close your file. Well, you got it too? Okay, so here's my, the way I was raised, if it's my final notice, that's it, isn't it? I mean, isn't that the last one? Well, I got 14 more. How, how, I mean, I, they lie about that. Anything that I hear from somebody else, I, I, I believe the Bible as the Word of God, and we'll get to that here in just a second. But as far as everything else, I'm, I'm to the point, I'm trying to get to the end of life without being completely cynical about everything, but I'm, I'm almost there. I, my default mode is not to believe. Uh, stealing's okay now in a lot of the world. You know, if you keep it under a certain amount, I can't imagine seeing somebody keeping track on a calculator to make sure they didn't go over a thousand bucks so they could steal everything that they had uh, and haul it out. I mean, that's, that's the world that we live in. Uh, morals are off the rail. Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with uh, intimacy uh, within the lines that God's drawn, man and a woman in marriage. Go for it. That's, that's his gift. But everybody seems to be getting outside of those lines and doing all kinds of other things. And that's the world in which we live. The, we have the darkness of moral failure. Now, I don't want you to give up, though. Because things that are going on now have always been going on. I, uh, I was reading in Genesis the other day, and I read about how the Moabites and the Ammonites got started. And I just thought, note to self, never read this text in public. I, I'm, not, I'm not going there. I just, it, was just, uh, it was so awful as far as what had happened. And yet God, because he's gracious and because he's good and because he's more powerful than anything else, he, he does not accomplish great things because of us. He accomplishes great things in spite of us. And so God allows darkness for reasons known only to himself. He, know, he allows the darkness of spiritual ignorance, the darkness of moral failure, and the darkness of fractured relationships. As Peter writes this, he writes with a somewhat of a broken heart. Uh, early on, uh, when he began to follow Jesus, he began to follow Jesus with his own brother, Andrew, and then also his partners as in the fishing business, uh, James and John. And they were with Jesus three years. They watched, you know, Jesus was crucified, and then he was raised from the dead. They were there when the birth of the church happened at Pentecost. And then shortly into that, Herod ran James through with a sword. Crazy King Herod killed him. Now this is Peter's friend. This is Peter's partner in ministry. This is Peter's uh, fellow apostle who sees Jesus in his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he got killed. And he, got, he died. And he had to bury him. I'm just reading between the lines. I'm sure they, they did. Fractured relationships. The greatest joy in this world comes from good relationships. The greatest pain in this world comes from fractured relationships. There's no time happier, I don't think, than the birth of a child. But there is a lot of grief when a loved one dies what joy uh, when a marriage takes place. What pain when divorce becomes a reality. Uh, what joy to have friends that love us and care for us and we do life together. But then also what pain comes when maybe you have to help a friend who's going through addiction or going through all kinds of other things. They're just... And so... Part of, why didn't God just fix all that stuff? I mean, that's, that's the question we ask. And the reality is what we see here is that God allows darkness. He allows darkness in the sense of spiritual ignorance and moral failure and fractured relationships. That's a part of life in this world. People die. Uh, people get divorced. Um, people sin. Uh, people have crazy ideas. That's the world in which we live. But in the midst of that, God provides light. 
And basically, he gives us two things here, the light that God provides. He provides the light of his son and the light of his word. The light of his son. Uh, it says in verse 16, through the power and the coming of our Lord. The power refers to the present strength for living. Uh, he, this is a reference to Jesus. He, met, he later says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So he's talking about Jesus. That through his son, light comes to us. Spiritual insight, moral strength for living day by day. Where does that come from? It comes from uh, through his son. And uh, he says, my beloved son. Peter had a personal relationship with Jesus. He knew him. He had known him for three years. He had walked with him. He knew what it was to spend time with him. And he has a relationship with him. And I want to remind you that if you want to navigate the dark world, if you want to be able to live, if you want to be able to, 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 to know God's best, there has to be, when I say provided light through his son, through his son, that means through a personal relationship with Jesus that you have, that he is the source of spiritual insight, he is the, the source of spiritual strength, and you have to have a relationship with him. Um, I'm convinced that people can become religious, but they bypass a relationship with Jesus. That, heard about an evangelist one time and he always preaching about you must be born again you must be born again you've got to be born again and he I mean every sermon is about every, you've got to be born again somebody said why are you always preaching about you got to be born again he said because you got to be born again uh, and that's what I want to make a point to you today is it's not enough just to come to church it's not just to just try harder that it's through a relationship with Jesus through his son through God's son that there is a transformation that takes place and there is power to be able to live in the midst of darkness because of what God does through you when you personally place faith in Jesus. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That has to happen in your life. And it can happen in your life. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And you have to have that as a reality. So God provides light through his son and then also through his word. He says in verse 19, And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. The prophetic word. This is the word of God. All of, for him at this time, the Old Testament, all the Old Testament, he had the New Testament hadn't written yet. He's writing part of it here. But it would apply to all of the word of God. Uh, there are over 3,800 times in the Old Testament that the authors of the Old Testament refer to what they're writing as the Word of the Lord or the Word of God. I didn't count all those. I read that, trusting somebody else on it. Uh, you know, but that's, so, so when they write, they're not just thinking, I'm just going to give my thought for the day. I'm going to write a blog. They know that they are giving us the word of God. He, he carries on and says, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy, verse 20, of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Nobody originated Scripture themselves. Nobody came up with it themselves. This isn't what man did. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The word carried along, it was a nautical term like a, a, a boat, a ship, uh, Acts 27, verses 15, and I think it's 19, use it about a ship that Paul was in, that it was pushed by the waves, it was pushed by the wind, it couldn't, it couldn't go against it. And the scriptures don't bypass the personalities of those who are writing them. Paul definitely writes in a different way than John, in a different way than Peter, in a different way than, than uh, uh, Moses. Uh, but they were not making this stuff up themselves. They were under compulsion by the Holy Spirit that God gives to us his word. And so we have the prophetic word. And, and Peter says, when I saw the, this appearance of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, it even more confirmed the reality of the word of God. The word of God is given in its original manuscripts, or in the original time, was completely without error. Now, uh, here's what you need to understand about translation. Somebody asked me before church, what, what translation do you use? Well, I've changed a few times preaching through the years. I use the ESV. 
the English Standard Version, not because I think it's superior to everything else, but it's real easy for me to remember because of ES, Earl Stevenson Version, uh, English Standard Version. So that's, that's no, I've, I've changed a few times. And here's, here's the way that deal works. When the Bible is translated, they go back to as many original manuscripts as they can find. They can date those back to about 200 years after Christ. There's more authentic confirmation, and I can't get into all that right now, uh, for the Bible as far as the, the manuscripts they draw from. And they, they've actually improved over the years as the more and more discoveries that they've had. The Bible, can you say every word of every translation is completely accurate? No, there are some things that didn't get quite, they're not perfect. But as it was given by God, it was perfect. And the longer we, we know and the longer we, we study and everybody, some people give their lives to that, uh, all that they discover, it just more and more confirms the reality of the word of God, that he's given it to us. And as he was faithful to give it the first time, he oversees and makes sure that the scriptures continue to be adequate for what to believe and how to live. Uh, one of the big things that happened during the Reformation in 1517 is that Martin Luther uh, translated uh, the scriptures uh, from Latin into German and put it in the hands of the common people so they could read it for themselves. You can read the Word of God uh, for yourself, and the Holy Spirit, who led in the writing of the Word of God, it lives in you and can allow you to understand what the Word of God says and applies to you. When I was in my early 20s, I went through a period of time where I doubted, I, I qu questioned, how do I know that this is really God's word? How do I know that? Because I'd read something, you know, like in uh, John 8, at the beginning of that, it says this is not in the most reliable early manuscripts. Well, what's that mean? And then the end of the Gospel of Mark, and it said this, this is not in the most early, what, what are you talking about here? So I went through a period where I just thought, how do I know? I, I wasn't there when it happened. I, how do I know that I can base my life and base my eternity? I hope you don't dis aren't disappointed here. I'm being real transparent. Uh, Confession is good for the soul, bad for the reputation. Uh, but anyway, God pulled me through that so that I was more confident than ever that what I had in my hands as far as if I would read it and I would apply it, that it'll transform my life and it's adequate for living and adequate for dying, and that, that it's good. Now, I prayed and I thought, and here's what else I did. I kept reading. I kept reading the Bible. I didn't quit and just say, well, I'm just going to quit. because I, you know, And then when someone tells you, I don't believe the Bible because it's full of contradictions, ask them this, which ones? Show it to me. And they'll go, Oh, don't know. But, and here's what I heard a, a highly educated person say one time. They said, they said hey, you can't trust the Bible because it's a translation of 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 a translation. Like you're playing gossip. You know, you ever do that, get in a circle and say, you know, the uh, duck walked across the road and got in a truck. And by the time you get, get to the end of it, it's like, uh, it just, that isn't what happened. Every translation of the scripture goes back to the same documents, the same original, the Hebrew and Greek, and then they translate from that using what they have known. So you have the best copy of scripture available that's ever been, uh, that you can read. The problem is not that people read the Bible and find all these contradictions. The problem is people get a Bible and set it on the shelf and never look at it. The Bible will change you. So the source of light, and that's what he says, you do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place. How do I navigate life? How do I get through life? By reading the Word of God, applying the Word of God, this is adequate to know what to believe and how to live, and that's how I get through the dark times in life is through his Word because of his Son who lives inside of me. So God allows darkness, God provides light, and light overwhelms darkness. No amount of darkness can keep the light from shining. This happens daily. It says, pay attention to it as a lamp shining in a dark place. And so as we listen to the word of God, as the son of God lives inside of us, then it allows us 
to navigate life as we live day by day. This happens daily. It's for us daily that light overwhelms darkness. Um, it happens eventually. He says in verse 19, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. That's a reference to the second coming of Jesus. That the word of God will guide you, the son of God will empower you for the rest of your life. And eventually, one day, the darkness of spiritual ignorance and moral failure and fractured relationships, that's all over with. Eventually, light will overwhelm darkness. It does so daily in our lives as we live. It will do so eventually and it will do so permanently. And it says here, the morning star rises in your heart until the day dawns. So until the day dawns means that there will be this light that comes when Christ returns and we're in heaven forever and ever. And there is no more uh, darkness, no more spiritual ignorance, no more uh, uh, moral failure, no more fractured relationships. And then the morning star rises in your heart you personally, that there is light forever uh, and ever. We don't wrestle with darkness from now on. We don't wrestle with the realities of death and all the things associated with a fallen world. That's not going to be a part of the world to come. I was over at Bill Corning's the other day, and we were talking about a lot of stuff. And I, when I was leaving, uh, I asked him, well, first of all, I saw a picture of his wife, Pat, and uh, asked him how long she'd been gone. She's been gone about six years. And then when we were leaving, uh, he was good friends, or still is friends, with Jimmy Carter. And I said, do you miss Jimmy? Because he died last December. And he said, yeah, I miss him a lot. But he's having a good time. And I thought, what a great word to me about every loved one that I've lost. What a great word for you. Yeah, we miss them, but they're having a good time. They're in the land of eternal day. Isn't that what the old hymn said? Okay, so I'm going to end in an odd way. I'm not going not to do a dance. So God allows darkness God provides light. Light overwhelms darkness. I was reading in 2 Corinthians 4 this past week, and it said we have the treasure of the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ in uh, jars of clay, that we are that jar of clay. Now, if we have the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ inside of us after we're saved, how does that light get out? Because a clay pot is dense and it doesn't let light out does it i mean you, any of you have any clay pots hanging up over your for a chandelier no the way that the light gets out is if there's a crack in the pot or if the pot's broken and i'm not saying you're a bu bunch of crack pots uh, <laughs> but here's what god showed me those things in your life that hurt, those things in your life that broke you, those things in your life that you probably said, why? When you're surrendered to Christ and submitted to his word, those are the very things that allow the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ to shine out of you. So rather than regretting and fighting against those things that have broken us, those things that have broken us actually make us where God can use us to show his light to others. Yeah, it's a dark world. But God's given us his son and his word. And eventually, all of darkness is going to be overcome. And between now and then, you can pay attention to the scripture and to the sun, and you're going to be just fine. Let's stand for prayer. God, we're reminded that the world is dark around us. It affects us. It affects our families. It affects our friends. It affects the world. Uh, but we thank you that in the midst of the darkness that you have provided light and help us to navigate 
darkness with your word because of your son. So I thank you for the way that you use broken people, broken lives, surrendered to you to show forth the gospel and the reality of Jesus. In his precious name we pray. Amen. If I can help you in the, as we sing, I'll be here at the front. Blessed assurance Jesus is mine Oh, what a for the first time is just, it's incredible. There's squeals and screams, and they are so excited to see what's inside their box. Oh, my goodness! Every shoebox gift represents the love of God to them. 
We are so excited. Many of the celebrities in the show walked for the first time in their life. We're here with Operation Christmas Child. The kids are so excited. We had the opportunity to hand out some of the boxes. There was so much joy, so much happiness. And it gives us an opportunity to present the gospel. We pray that these boxes will be used to bring a lot of happiness and joy, but more importantly, the gospel to each heart, all these little children around the world. What a great gift. I get a present, I get to know who Jesus is, but not only that, I get to be discipled in his ways. Hundreds of thousands of volunteers work with Operation Christmas Child every year, preparing these boxes, praying for the boxes, that God will use them in a mighty way for His glory. This little shoebox has the opportunity to change the world. Not only are they going to get a shoebox, they're going to get the love and the message of Jesus Christ. Some go by helicopter, some go by ship, some go by camel, donkeys, canoes. We go at great lengths to take these boxes to children in the most remote parts of the world. And it's an incredible journey. After these children open the box, they have the opportunity to go through the greatest journey, the 12 lesson discipleship program, where they get to learn more about Jesus Christ. Right now, I'm right outside of Mazlan, Mexico, about a six hour drive up in the mountains. This is an indigenous people group, people that never heard the gospel before. The kids and the families that accepted Christ, almost a hundred all together, have now started a church. Hemos visto una experiencia preciosa, grande, en el pueblo. Y ese pueblo va a ser el medio para llevar el evangelio a otro lugar. Que estas bendiciones que son de las cajitas, sigan llegando hacia arriba y a la montaña. This shoebox gives us an opportunity to continue to shine the bright light of the gospel in the darkest and remote places around the world. We're seeing families come to know Jesus. Churches are sprouting up in these communities. These children are rising up to be disciples in their own country. The gift box and the gospel of Jesus Christ bring hope to our children to bring the smiles back on their faces. No greater need and no greater time than right now for us to go out and serve boldly. This is what these shoe boxes are all about, to go out and bring a hope of Jesus Christ around the world. I'm just so amazed at what God does each and every year. This is an opportunity to impact the lives of millions of children, just like you've seen. But we need more boxes for next year. Every box is an opportunity for us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thank you, and God bless each and every one. It is that time again. Operation Christmas Child is upon us. Uh, if you are interested in filling a shoebox or two or 12 or however many, uh, you can pick them up. We have them on both sides here, at, uh, right outside by the Welcome Center and then right over here. Uh, feel free to, to grab a box. And uh, this is a wonderful ministry that not only shares the joy of Christmas, but the, most importantly, the message of Jesus Christ. So. Uh, pickup week for that is going to be the 15th through the 22nd. So we're going to be gathering boxes throughout from here to uh, Ben. So thank you so much for being here. You're dismissed.